Good morning, everybody. I'm going to invite you to grab your muffins and start settling in. You can grab a muffin or a cup of coffee. I know we got a few more people coming in, but settle on into a chair. Let's, uh, let's, we are having fun, but let's get started. I, uh, I count it as a blessing that we have good conversations and good friends that we're glad to see as we gather this morning. Uh, one of the things I like to say about our faith talks as we uh, host these each and every Sunday is part of what is particularly beautiful about these are the excellent people that we get to learn from, like Dr. Otadi. The other part of this that's particularly beautiful is how these, what you learn from people like Dr. Otadi, will, how that will shape your conversations in your small groups in your Sunday school classes, as you care for friends who are going through a difficult time. So I encourage you to take what you learn and share that, have conversations. We'll have coffee and muffins for you to continue conversation long after our time here ends. As we settle in, I wanna point out a few things to you. This is the housekeeping part of my introduction. It's the boring part, but it's the necessary part. First, you'll notice on your chairs that many of you have an index card and a pen. If you don't have that, there's one probably in the chair near you. And that is for two reasons. One, for you to take notes and maybe stick these in your Bible at a later time. And two, on one of those sides, if you would like to submit a question, uh, this is how we like to do our question and response time. Uh, Stephanie, who's in the back, and I will walk around and grab these questions from you. Uh, as Dr. Otadi finishes his time, and then we'll use that as a way of asking questions uh, later in the morning. So I invite you to do that. The second housekeeping item I'd like to remind you of is that we do this series every single Sunday. Um, we have fantastic people who come in and we have the opportunity to learn from. And next Sunday, December 1st, we have Dr. Bor or, excuse me, Boris Henderson, who is a champion of affordable housing. He serves on the Habitat for Humanity board and is the executive director of Aldersgate Community here in Charlotte. Um, and he's a particularly knowledgeable person about affordable housing. We look forward to welcoming him here. So I invite you to kind of settle in. And as we uh, move from getting here, whatever you're coming with to actually being here, let's do so by centering ourselves in a word of prayer. Will you pray with me? Gracious God, gather us in. Help us to lay aside the worries and to-do lists that have come with us. The oven that might be on. The person we haven't called back yet. The friend that we need to reach out to. The email we haven't sent. Instead, let us listen. Listen for the ways that we might learn about you and pour into us a spirit of curiosity that we can learn from Doug, that we can be transformed by the goodness that you share and the ways that you are at work in the world. Be with us in this time. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. It is now my pleasure to welcome Dr. Doug Otadi, who's both a world-renowned theologian and a professor at the very nearby Davidson College. And I'd like to call him now a friend of covenant. So will you join me in welcoming him? Thanks. Uh, thank you. I'm very, very pleased to be here. Uh, among other things, I don't know if you've driven down from Davidson in the morning on Sundays on Route 77, but it's driving the way it was meant to be. Uh, there's no one else on the road. I mean, you just go right down and, and it's, it's very, very nice. And the road is adequate for the traffic, uh, which is the only day of the week I think that's the case. Uh, so I'm very pleased to be here. Um, I was here last month, and you've had a number of themes, and, and th th this theme this month is, it is well with my soul. That's a, that comes from a hymn uh, written by Horatio Spafford, as I'm sure all of you know by this time, and uh, he wrote it in 1873. He had financial losses in Chicago, uh, Chicago fire, then a depression, and then his family uh, went on a trip to Europe. He sent them on a ship, and it all went, they went down at sea in 1873. So he wrote this hymn, this song, in response to those things. And it is a heartfelt song, and it expresses something uh, very important to him. 
uh, at, at that time and for the rest of his life. The first verse um, goes like this. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to know, it is well, it is well with my soul. Now, that, that the hymn has a number of verses, but that's basically the gist of it there. Uh, one thing I want to do just before we start commenting on the theme is to say that the word translated as soul in the New Revised Standard Version and a number of the other versions in the Greek has a very wide range of meanings. And if you if you uh, limit it to soul as, I don't know, some part of somebody that goes somewhere when they die, you're not going to get it right. Uh, it includes everything from self to the emotional center of the person, the things like that. It's not really initially an, a metaphysical question part of somebody or something along those lines. Um, so we want to just keep that wide meaning, uh, broad meaning in mind as we talk about, uh, reflect theologically on the theme from Spafford's uh, song. Uh, I'm going to start by just observing that many people have inklings of something encompassing and beyond in, with, and under their experience of objects, others, and themselves. And that's a pretty bland way of putting it. But I can tell you sometimes we were sitting in the backyard, my wife will look at some of the birds and so forth, and she'll think, well, you know, this is really sort of remarkable, isn't it? Here are all these birds doing this stuff, and they're going to keep on doing it no matter what goes on with us. And they look pretty terrific, and the thing just keeps right on going. Now, that's a kind of interest. The thing just keeps right on going with these birds and everything else. And the sense is that, well, you know, you're a part of something pretty magnificent here. Not really sure exactly what it is. That's fair enough. But it's kind of fun to sit there. Now, if I'm sitting there with her, I'm probably having a drink, but she's not. And, and, and we look at the birds and so forth and see it that way. Uh, some, something I like to encourage my classes to do once in a while is to uh, pick out an evening that's clear, uh, sit down and just look out into the nighttime sky. So you can you can do the you can do the seminar or, uh, for Psalm eight, right? And you can look out into the sky and you can see all the stuff that's up there. And you got to pick a place where there's not too much ambient light if you can find that. And that's going to be tougher here than it is in Davidson, but it's not that easy there either. And then you just and just look, just look and see what you got. What you've got is you've got, I don't know, countless number of objects. They're visible with the naked eye. We don't really even know whether they're all still there because it takes the light a long time to get to us, right? Uh, they are thousands of light years away, some of them even that can be seen with the naked eye. And you and I know that there's countless others out there, objects. Now, the light's coming, and we can see the light, but we could misunderstand this. Uh, stars and, and, and heavenly objects, they're not like flashlights pointed at you. They're more like a globe, There's an, and light's going everywhere. So we really flat don't know whether they're in something else looking at that light that many light years away that way, or that way, or that way, or that way, or that way. We just happen to catch some of it part of the time. Now, what I like to point out to my classes is it's pretty big. And we're in it, but it's enormous. Not only that, the idea that we're at the center of the things is perfectly absurd. No one thinks that any think. Maybe existentially they do, but they don't think it scientifically. And uh, this, this is a sort of an amazing thing that you're a part of. If you're reading Psalm 8, you can then raise a question. What are human beings? That thou art mindful of them, right? Okay, not a bad question. Like, what am I doing here? What's up? How come I'm part of this whole big thing here? Uh, well, I can see you know I. I think I do a couple of things, and I do a couple of things. Let's see what you say. Where, where is North Carolina on that scale? If I had a magic marker and I put a little dot up there on the board, it would be disproportionate if this were the whole map. Uh, that would be disproportionate for planet Earth, let alone North Carolina. North Carolina, you got to be kidding me. I mean, this 
nowhere, right? But it is somewhere. And every place is somewhere, and you and I are in it. Now, that's a kind of a, a remarkable thing. You can see it in Psalm 8, or you can just go outside sometime, look up on, 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 on a nice evening. Pope Francis says that religious classics help us to see that the universe unfolds in God, as he puts it. They indicate, quote, a mystical meaning to be found in a leaf, in a mountain trail, in dewdrops, in a poor person's face. I'd be willing to add the nighttime sky, huh? something like that. They invite us, quote, to embrace the world on a different plane, maybe to embrace it in a different way than we sometimes are interested in it. When I'm coming down Route 77, even on a nice morning like this morning with very little traffic, I don't really pay attention to everything in my field of vision. I can't. If I do that, I'm not going to get here in one piece. So I, I just select in accordance with my aim. And most of the time, that's what people do. They select what they pay attention to in accordance with their aim. A perfectly legitimate enterprise gets them there in one piece. But it's not really an adequate representation of what's going on, right? I mean, you know, if you're going down 77 and you had a sort of big panor panoramic view, there's you know some sort of bird goes overhead, there's something going on over this way, maybe there's an Italian bakery over here. I mean, there's all kinds of stuff going on. I don't see it. To embrace life, as uh, the Pope puts it, on a different plane, maybe involves, among other things, not only looking at it in accordance with our own aims and purposes. Just, just let it wander a little bit. I like to ask my students when they go on break, and they're on break now, to tell their parents or whoever they're going to go visit that their religious studies professor has an assignment for them, and that is they're supposed to get up one day and with no plan and do nothing in particular. Just see what happens. I don't know how many of them do it. They're Davidson students. They're a little overly motivated, but, you know, okay. Uh, so, indeed, many people find these sorts of inklings sensibilities and apprehensions compelling they find in face of stars and cosmos and sparrow and sky and community and companion intimations of something mysterious daunting terrifying awe-inspiring and good the sentiments sometimes are expressed in poetry and song and we've mentioned psalm 8 but you know good old henry van dyke's words to beethoven's music all thy works with joy surround thee, center of unbroken praise, field and forest, vale and mountain, flowery meadow, flashing sea, chanting bird and flowing fountain, call us to rejoice in thee. It's a nice hymn, as also a kind of panoramic vision. In his Confessions, St. Augustine wonders, which comes first, to call upon you or to praise you, to know you or to call upon you? Well, he doesn't know the answer to that. Fair enough. That's why he raises the question. And then he writes further, quote, I would not exist, I would not be at all, were you not in me. That's an interesting idea. That, that he wouldn't exist at all were God not in him somehow. Now, he thinks God is the power of being that makes all things exist. And if he exists, then God must be in him too, see? He said, I would not be at all were you not in me, or should I say rather that I should not exist if I were not in you? The beginning of the Confessions, a justifiably famous book. He claims that God suffuses heaven and earth, filling all things, quote, with the whole of yourself. Now, if he's right about that, then you and I have a way toward the divine by turning inward as well as outward. I mean, there's no place you can turn that isn't a way toward the divine if you have eyes to see or if you catch a glimpse. Uh, there's no place that you need to journey to in order to encounter the omnipresent God who fills all. I mean, it's just simple by definition. Christian faith emerges from a specific historic insight or clue and no razzle-dazzle here. The clue is Jesus Christ, 
the word of God, who does what? Who discloses the God who makes rain to fall and sun to shine on the fields of all, on the good and the bad, the just and the unjust, out of the Sermon on the Mount. This is the God whose care for all, especially the poor and the downtrodden, comes to fulfillment in a kingdom where love of God, the one who bears all things, and love of neighbor, or all the things that are born, come into focus. That's what you're supposed to be up to. And there's an easy reason why. It's because God loves all things, you see? If you, if you want to imitate God, then you've got to be benevolent to everything. Now, that's a steep, uh, a steep requirement, and we're not likely to make it most of the time, but that's the idea. If you want to be perfect as your Heavenly Father is perfect, you need to act like your Heavenly Father. Well, that's what it means. That means sending rain and, and sun on the fields of the just and the unjust to your friends and your enemies. See you later. Now, if you have both your friends and your enemies in there, who's left out? Nobody. Pretty simple. Uh, the Puritan Jonathan Edwards, an American theologian, says that this insider suggestion in Jesus Christ, the Word of God, uh, in this insight, we may sense what he calls the divine excellence. Actually, he calls it excellence C, but I think if you use his version of English, it doesn't really mean the same thing. So let's just say the divine excellence. What's the divine excellence? It is the dynamic tendency of God who goes out to create, hold all things in relation to God's self, and then also to bring this relationship, which neither falters nor fails, to fulfillment. That's the God who creates, governs, and redeems. Now, if you just take these words, create, govern, and redeem, and just think of them as a kind of map of a tendency, of a direction. Right? What it means is that God always goes out from God's self to be in a relationship with stuff that God creates. Why is God created? Oh, trick question. We got no reason except God kind of wants to do it. That's it. No, compul no compulsion, just does it. So going out to create, govern, and redeem is what God does. That's God being God. You know, like an Irish setter is being an Irish setter runs. God being God is out to create, govern, redeem. That's what God does. Now, for Edwards, that's the divine excellence. Why does God do it? Just because it is gracious. And being gracious... Bestowing gifts is God being God. That's what God does. My wife teaches three-year-olds, and sometimes what three-year-olds do is they run around like nuts. That's what they do. That's what they're for. You try and keep a three-year-old from doing that, you're being oppressive. That, that, that's not they, Part of the time, that's what they need to do. They also need to learn that other people are people. This is part of this, the curriculum for the three-year-olds. But so this other directed excellence of the creator, governor, and redeemer who goes out, this is what's disclosed in Jesus Christ. Okay? Jesus Christ wants to talk about the God who creates all things, governs all things, redeems. This excellence, according to Edwards and others, captures our attention, and it clarifies or develops our experiential inklings, right? The things where you're sitting in the backyard looking at the stars. Oh, there's something going on here, and I don't know what it is. Okay? The divine excellence creates, governs, redeems. That's what's going on. Okay. That's a clue. The excellence uh, then perceived draws us out from ourselves. That's a key thing. It draws It's not easy to do. It's probably God's biggest miracle. Uh, that occasionally draw us out from ourselves, away from our incessant preoccupation with our isolated interests. Something like a beautiful mountain, valley, or river, if you get to see it, can do it. You just look at it. You know, if you go out to the Grand Canyon and get not so close to the edge, you know, close to the seaweed, you know, maybe the first thing that occurs to you is, 
Wow. That would be good. Apparently, there's some people, the first thing that occurs to them is, how can I monetize this? But nevertheless, uh, there are still a lot of people who, when they see the Grand Canyon, it's just, holy smoke, look at that. That's what I want you to think about. What is it that draws your attention out? Now, for me, you know, I used to, it's root for the Cubs, you know, boy. but you'd see Ozzy Smith playing shortstop for the St. Louis Cardinals. Now, you never seen a more acrobatic shortstop than this guy, Ozzy Smith. I mean, he said he covered the whole thing. Some of these guys don't commit many errors, but they don't have that much range. He's everywhere. <clears throat> Acrobatic plays. What's the point of an acrobatic play at shortstop? Well, there's no real point. It's not like it saves the world. It doesn't set off missiles. It doesn't pre prevent missiles from falling. It, it's simply gratuitously excellent. You look at it and you go, wow. And you do that even if you're a Cubs fan and what they're doing, the Cardinals are beating them all the time. So just think of things that draw you out. You go to a museum, you see a, a magnificent painting. What's the first question? The first question, how much is it worth? No, the first was just that, just that. Now, the idea then is that the compelling divine excellence in, with, and under, and beyond all things, including ourselves, suggests that this often unknown God, as Paul says in his speech in Acts 17, is the God within whom we, we live and move and have our being in you. That's the move. Okay. The one that goes out to create, govern, and redeem is the same one intimated in looking at the nighttime sky. Now, since God is gracious, this means that all things, and we among them, and it's important to put it that way, I, I think that the American evangelicalism is just fine, but one of the things that's not so great about it is that sometimes it wants to start with God saves you or me. Once I know that God saves Otadi, then I'm willing to think about what else God does. No, 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 no. What Edwards wants to tell you is, oh, the excellence of God, like Ozzie Smith at shortstop, it draw, draws you out from yourself. Now you know that God is gracious, and that must mean everything, even including Otadi, has worth. Start there. Don't start here. Start there. If you start there, then you're set up to understand that loving God and neighbor is simply part of the program. It's not a question of, can I get what I need first? And then maybe I'll think about the rest of the world. Uh-uh. Draw it out from yourself. Okay, so if God is gracious, then all things and we among them have worth before God. This simply is the case. There's no razzle-dazzle here. You don't need a major argument. God creates all things, holds them in existence, and redeems all things. They all have worth before God, period. We often fail to see and to feel this because we're curved in upon ourselves, as Augustine would say. Our isolated interests, aims, and accomplishments are like driving down Route 77, just paying attention to getting where we want to go. Fair enough, but there's but the whole big thing going on is more than that. In fact, God is the God of grace, and all things, including us, have worth before God. And this fact depends on nothing that we think, do, or believe. We're simply called to accept it. It's a fact. It's a fact like it's sunny out today. Whether or not it's sunny out today doesn't depend on whether I believe it. The sun is out today, period. Whether or not God is the God of grace does not depend upon whether I believe it. God is the God of grace, period, like it's sunny out today. Okay, that's the big deal. Theologically speaking, then, it is well with my soul or with the emotional center of my person means this. God is the God of grace in whom we live and move and have our being, the God who bestows existence and life on all as well as new life 
the one, the, the one that bestows gifts that neither falter nor fail. God gives gifts, otherwise we're not here. First gift, gift of existence, right back with Augustine. This is the fundamental assurance. It means that before God, I have worth. It is well with my soul, whatever my lot. Spafford's right. It's well with my soul. Depends on nothing I do. Simply the case. Okay. Now there's a but, all right? And the but is this. The assurance that all, including us, have worth always entails the further sense that we should love all neighbors and even our enemies. Why? Because all have worth before God. That's where we started. See? So one thing you get out of this is you get assurance. All have, have worth. Well, turns out I exist. Guess I must have lucked out too. I have worth. Okay, fine, assured. But you never have this idea without also having the idea that all other things have worth too. And we're supposed to acknowledge and be committed to the welfare and the good of all other things. That's the love of neighbor part, see? And the neighbor is people, but it's non-human things and all that kind of stuff. So, we have an assurance, but it always entails the further sense that we should love all neighbors, even our enemies. Edwards, we talked about him a second ago, we'll talk about him again. Edwards and his abolitionist students called it universal benevolence, that is being benevolent to everything. Right? Universal benevolence, that's what God is up to. That's what I'm supposed to be up to. Only problem here is that I'm not that good at it. Universal benevolence. This is what it will. Uh, th this this is what uh, they thought it will mean to be perfect, as our heavenly Father is perfect, the one who sends rain and sun on the fields of all. Matthew five forty eight. But if this is true, then you're supposed to love all others. That's the way things are supposed to be. Right? And by this measure, unfortunately, neither we nor our world are as they should be. And so our uneasy conscience accuses us. Not assurance, but you've also got accusation. Perhaps paradoxically, then, when it is well with my soul, when I live in the apprehension and conviction that all, including me, have worth before the gracious God, I am not only assured, but I'm also troubled. Now, this is true of Edwards' students here. Samuel Hopkins, Jonathan Edwards Jr., his son and so forth, turned out to be abolitionists. They thought that because God loves all things, you're supposed to love neighbor. This meant that uh, the golden rule, treat others as you want to be treated, is a rule of thumb for justice. That's how it's supposed to be. And they thought that this country was not doing that at all. Not a bit. In fact, they thought that the founders of the country would be all right, people in a way were duplicitous. They wrote, all men are created equal, but they didn't believe it. And they wrote letters to the Continental Congress that tell them. And that was true, the minister in Newport, Rhode Island, and other places like that. Not everybody. Why did they do it? Because the documents intimated a kind of universal justice that the country was unwilling to enact. Pretty simple. Okay, that's what they thought. So 
to Jonathan Edwards Jr., Samuel Hopkins, that they think God is gracious and have assurance. Oh, sure they did. Was it well with their soul? Yeah, it was. Does that mean they were just feeling peachy keen, like everything was okay all the time? No, it didn't. They were troubled. They're both assured and troubled. Simple point. Jesus is assured. He's also troubled. The world's not the way it's supposed to be. He knows that. Don't throw the first stone. How does he come up with that idea? Because he sees people throwing stones. Thanks a bunch. Okay. So, by this measure then, perhaps paradoxically, when it's well with my soul, I am also troubled. Two things at once. For one thing, if I'm honest with myself, I do not always, or perhaps even generally, love all others and even enemies. Uh, it's just the way I like myself. See? Now, you probably come from, you all come from families, and they all, you know, all come from the Otati family, so you may not have seen this up close and personal, but I have. I mean, the, the Otati family is just full of people who um, are better at taking account of their own isolated interests than they are at taking account of other people's interests. And I, I'm one of the chief offenders. When, um, you know, whenever the, the, the Bellevue Avenue in Richmond, and whenever there's a big decision to be made, like, you know, are we going to move somewhere or something like that? Uh, well, see, uh, uh, neither Pam nor Katie and Albert left me alone in the room to decide. Uh, uh, um, they were sure to be there. And, and I think the reason they, they weren't convinced, see, that I would take their interests optimally into account. Thought I might kind of skew it a little bit toward what I'd like to be. That's fair enough. I wasn't a senior. I wasn't a junior in high school. I mean, I, I, and I hadn't been for a long time. What are their interests? Oh, I could kind of remember. But so they show up to weigh in. How would they get the impression that I might not take their interests optimally into account? Well, one thing is they might have seen me in operation before, so they knew that I didn't always get that right. And the other thing is they might have seen other people in operation before, and they knew that other people didn't always get that right. And they might have even, oh, maybe even, they reflected a little bit on themselves and understood that they don't always get it right. That's interesting. I used to go to faculty meetings at Eden Seminary in Virginia. I want to tell you they were not my favorite things. They would start at 4.30, and they would end, like, with the eschaton or something like that. They kept going and going and going. We did everything in faculty meetings there. We knew how the grounds were being kept. We knew about each student. We voted on each student, a bunch of stuff. I mean, you just, you know, uh, I, they start at 4.30, go forever. Now, I noticed that even though I didn't like those things, I went to them because it seemed to me that my colleague, nice though they may be, might not take my interests optimally into account, so I showed up. And here's the other kicker. Every time I showed up, they were all there too, for the same reason. So you see, people have a tough time with this business here about loving all others, including enemies. I fall short, I stray from the way. And if I don't somehow submerge or repress this fact, my conscience formed by the excellence of God and the person of Jesus Christ, the person for others, my conscience convicts me. What's more, it also convicts my community of failings, including injustices, destructive actions, policies, and inordinately selfish and prideful impulses. So when my soul is healthy or well, I am also remorseful. Okay, I can have more than one emotion at the same time. It'll be all right. Moreover, when I survey the world of persons and communities, nations and empires, I not only convict myself and my own community, but I also see a fragmented and destructive world in Gaza and Israel and Lebanon, the treatment of refugees, immigrants and aliens, just, and that's just now. You can pick any decade you want. That's just the treatment of immigrants and aliens. I mean, look, um, people don't move them numbers from places just because one day they decided to go to the United States and be a big pain in the neck. Um, they move because Napoleon invades. 
They moved because there's no potatoes in Ireland. They moved because there's no economy in Scandinavia. They moved because there's no economy in rural Italy. That's how they show up. Yeah, people don't just jump to, to make these long journeys, you know, that are hazardous and everything else and leave everything they know and all their connections just to be a big pain in the butt. They always stay where they are. I seen the place where the Otadis are from. It's a village called Otadi outside of Naples on the way up in the mountains somewhere. And there's no Otadi. But drop dead gorgeous too. And medieval and nice. They didn't leave that because they didn't like it. To go where? To go to somewhere called Brazil? I mean, come on. That's it, it, not what people do. All right. They need a reason. But so you want to just see the world. To, so then when my soul is healthy or well, and I look at the world, I'm dissatisfied and sorrowful too. I convict myself from all the sorrowful of that world. All these, these emotions at once. Well, last thing I want to point out then is that this bit of wisdom, that when it's well with your soul, you're both assured and convicted and sorrowful, is a bit of wisdom that you see in Reformed worship services often in the first segment of it, sometimes called gathering, and that's what you guys call it here, and that is a ni nice service. Uh, it has the following basic elements in it. First, there's an opening hymn. This is ordinarily a hymn of praise. Uh, John Milton's hymn, Let us with a gladsome mind praise the Lord who is so kind for his mercy shall endure ever faithful, ever sure. There's a hymn of praise. There follows a gathering prayer, ordinarily a prayer of adoration, with phrases like, God of all glory, on this first day you began your creation, and your new creation grant that we, the people you create with water and the Spirit, may be joined with all your works in praising you for your great glory. That's a prayer of adoration. It's not asking for something, it's saying, wow, right? That is, worship begins with the good creature doing what it is created to do. Namely, thank and praise the God of grace who bestows gifts. Then the service takes a turn, and you'll all be familiar with it here, to a call to confession and a prayer of confession. Before the God of grace and other people, we confess our sin with remorse and sorrow at ourselves and at, what the wor and, and at a world gone awry. Thus, in a call to confession, the presider may say, quote, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Look, you can confess that you're a sinner, but it's before the God of grace. If it's not before the God of grace, you may as well stay at home and read the, the New York Times or even the, the, even the Charlotte paper. If it comes to that, you'll be done with it pretty quickly. But nevertheless, there's no point in doing this unless it's the God of grace. But it is in the call to confession. In a prayer of confession, we may say in unison, quote, merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart and mind and strength. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. It's a confession. In your mercy, then it says, forgive because it is the God of grace. After the call to confession and the prayer of confession, what shows up? A curie. The liaison is the Lord have mercy. It's an appeal for grace. After that, what? After that, then an assurance of grace that goes something like this. The mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. We are forgiven for them. Look, good creature, praise God who gives gifts. God of grace. Good creature knows the good creature's not right. A little dissatisfied. Good creature is assured that God is the God of grace. And after that, in these services, you get real lucky. Someone reads a summary of the law, not to accuse you, because the law is my joy and my delight, as it says in Psalm 119. And it is a guide to lead a good and faithful life together. It's a gift. 
And then after that, you're real lucky you passed the piece. So you shake hands with a bunch of people you kind of know to symbolically enact something that's not really present yet, and that is the kingdom. Okay, great worship service. And every week you get the same thing. And what it's telling you is that it is well with your soul and you're also appropriately dissatisfied and troubled. In sum, what you have there is a worshipful expression of wisdom before the God of grace. It's a wise service. It's a smart service. It's a theologically astute service. So to conclude, a soul that is healthy and well is assured, but also troubled and restless. It is committed to a new commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. And so, even though it is assured, it hopes for something different and for a changed future. And that's why it's dissatisfying. Okay, I'll try. And, uh, you know, we've got some time for questions, I think. And, you know, who knows whether I can answer them or not. You know, I'm just kind of making it up up here. Okay. So. Well, first, let's uh, join. Will you join me in thanking Dr. Otadi for that fantastic? What I'll say is uh, our questions that are coming in, I would invite you to remember that this is more question and response time, not question and answer. Okay. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a big, heavy thing to answer uh, all right. all these questions, all right. All right. Uh, especially as I ask you this first question yeah. um, in some of what you were sharing, balanced with what was read this morning in our worship service, which was uh, from Romans 12 to uh -huh. hate what is evil. And uh -huh. so this question is, how do we navigate love all people, as you uh -huh. named, and hate what is evil? Okay, so um, the, the classic sort of deal at a Christian tradition on that is that evil does not mean a second metaphysical principle that is incorrigibly evil. Uh, evil means a corrupted good, okay? So uh, if you ask John Milton about why it is that uh, Adam and Eve fell, and John Milton's a good old Calvinist, so, uh, he says, well, what happened was before then there was good angels and so forth, and then bad angels fell, and they tempted the people to do something to do something bad. And you think, well, thanks for nothing, buddy. It's an epic poem, but it's not an answer. All I got here is now the angels fell. Why did they fall? Well, they fell because, you know, they messed up, and, 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 and evil is attractive, and there you go. But look what happens. Satan, in Milton's poem, is Lucifer, the fallen angel of the morning. Satan is a corrupted good. He is not a second metaphysical principle evil. So we go back to this. You're supposed to love everyone, including yourself, but you're not supposed to like. You're not so, you're, maybe you hate the corruptions and the corrupted good, the corruptions of the good. And you try and change that. Um, one little added thing here that perhaps Milton wasn't going to do, but um, you may as well love them even though they're corrupted because it's the only people you're going to get. But it doesn't mean you have to love the corruption right? in the community and so forth. So put it that way. I know as we approach the Thanksgiving holiday, that's uh, probably a question that is coming up for a lot of people as they head home to places that have uh, maybe different opinions than they have, yeah. and um, they've struggled with, you know, long past. So I think your words will help us not just in our souls, but also around our Thanksgiving tables. Um, one question that came in, and we're kind of going all over the place here. So uh, this question is, speak to us about how you see God governs. Creating and redeeming seems a little easier to understand. How is God governing? All right. Well, uh, so so creating means gifts, right? I mean, so, so, so that you are is your first debt. It's the first gift, and it's your first debt. So you owe existence to something else. You know? Did not bring yourself into existence. Everyone knows that. Um, sometimes maybe they forget it. So your first debt is you got invited to the party of existence, which is not always fun, but the supposition is it's better than not to be. Uh, now, then, then 
redeem. Uh, we're going to uh, uh, turn things that have, that have been mis misshapen and corrupted and hopefully to a, a kind of fulfillment. Governance. Okay, there, there are old, old terms here like judgment and stuff. Um, judgment in the Bible generally does not mean just vaporize. It means, um, it means bad consequences of something that you do that call you to turn. It's an attempt to turn things around. The prophets are delivering oracles of judgment, not just because they want to see everything vaporized, but because they want things to turn. Judgment in that sense Oh, if you read Dickens as a Christmas carol, um, Scrooge is lucky to be blessed with the right nightmares. He's a very fortunate man. If he didn't have the right nightmares, he'd never turn. He has to be scared to death, really, fall on his own grave to get it right. Okay, lucky guy. He's a lucky guy because judgment, because he got scared to death with the right nightmares. Now, let's take some other things here. We've got an ecological crisis that we're not going to solve anytime soon. So we're going to have to mitigate it with different things and see how it goes. It's going to be a tough way to go. But the bad consequences of things that you chronically do don't have to be interpreted simply as destroying you. They are calls to turn, to get your attention to go to redirect aims and so forth. So in a sense, judgment is ordered toward redemption and grace. And you look at the biblical materials, you never have redemption and grace without judgment. It's always there. Now, sometimes it's expressed in highly symbolic ways. If you look at Revelation 18 to 22, Jesus shows up and leads the armies of heaven to defeat all the armies and kings of the earth. And out of his mouth comes a sword to kill them all. And uh, the kings of the earth are vanquished and they're eaten by birds of prey who then crap them out, right? And, you know, and, 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 and then, boom, you hit chapter 22. And all of a sudden, the new Jerusalem comes down from heaven. And here's a king, a clinker. And all the kings of the earth come in, bringing their glory into the. These are the guys that have just been eaten by the birds. I mean, what, what? Then it turns out the leaves of the tree of life are for the healing of the nations. That's everybody. What is going on here? I don't know all what's going on here. Could you have a kind of symbolic expression of transformation? It doesn't mean judgment simply vaporizes. They come back. So I suppose what I would say is that when you go to governance, one thing you have is you have things that uphold you that are general things that keep you in, in the, in the ballgame. You can be thankful for those. I mean, thank you. I mean, you, you got a harvest. You got something to eat. That's something to be thankful for. It's a good deal. And there's a lot of stuff like that. You know, families that are nurturing. So are families always nurturing? No, they're not. But, you know, a lot of times they are. And But the other thing is even the stuff that goes terribly awry does not have to be interpreted as simply an intention to destroy. It can be an intention to turn and to have other possibilities. And I think by and large, that's what one would like to say. That does not mean that everything works out happily for everyone, obviously, right? Because if you can have judgment and bad consequences, bad consequences are real. And not only that, they don't always fall on the people who enact bad consequences. They fall on the children of Coventry and Cologne. They fall on the children of Syria and of Beirut. They fall on... Uh, it's a tough world, and the calls of the right nightmares are not just bad things that can happen to you. Tiny Tim, gone. Something else, gone. The right nightmares are terrifying because terrible consequences fall on those who don't deserve it. So I would do something like that. 
uh, anyway. I think you can habilitate most of those old terms. You just got to fiddle with them a little bit. That certainly gives, I think, a lot of us much to think about. Um, something that you said in your opening, in your lecture, was uh, you hinted at American evangelicalism and this uh, claim that that churches, that the evangelicalism has done, which is once the believer believes, then God is good. And then God is kind of beginning, God's action begins in that person's life. Um, and I appreciate that you pushed against that. And this question, I think, hints at that. Then what is the point of belief? Okay. So, so, so Jonathan Edwards um, is sort of the original American evangelical, and he's got his head screwed on theologically straight, and this is what he has to say. Uh, he wants to say that when you are captivated by the divine excellence, you know that God is the God of grace. That's the fundamental thing to know. Once you know that, and that's not easy to know, then you know that you have worth. First thing, God of grace. Second thing, you have worth. It's actually third. Since God is the God of grace, everything is. So look what is wrapped up in the perception that God is the God of grace, which is the good news. The good news is not that Otadi alone is more valuable than everyone else. Yeah, too bad, too, huh? But that's not the good news. The good news is that God is a God of grace. That being the case, all things have worth, including me. So for Edwards, that experience that takes you out of yourself is the key experience. That's the key thing. Then secondarily, I understand that God loves me. God is gracious. Yes, sir. Sinners in the hands of Mary God. That's his sermon. It's part of a sequence that goes to another sermon that God is God is God of grace. They, they, they'll all pull it out of its sequence. But you got the judgment's real. He thinks so. But it's always bordered by this other stuff. So Edwards gets, I think, a bad rap in most high school English classes because they just take the one sermon and say, but it's a, it's, a, it's a pretty magnificent sermon in a way people remember it. I can say, that. and you know, the way he preached, he, he did, he was not a dramatic preacher. He just read them, but people were moved because the images were so kind of strong, right? Uh, but, uh, but yeah, so it is Edwards, and uh, let's just compare this to something that you can sometimes see, not always, there's a lot of different evangelicals out there. There's Charles Finney, who's an abolitionist, and it gets this right, uh, gets it right with Edwards, and some of Edwards students were, they're all there. Now, some evangelicals, not all, big group, are going to, from Edwards' point of view, flub it. They're going to think that you begin with, I have worth and I'm saved. And then I somehow struggle with how everyone else does. No. You begin with God is the God of grace. That means all have worth. Now, I have worth. Everyone has worth. The ethics in on the ground floor. The ethics in on the basic experience that God is the God of grace. So what I think, you don't have to go in there, I think Edwards is on the right end of this, in terms of evangelical stuff, I think some other preachers perhaps are not so clearly on the right end of it. They emphasize overly much the isolated person's salvation, and they fail in that sense maybe to draw the person out of themselves. And with that failure, you got a problem with an ethic and everything else, and there you go. Edwards is an evangelical. Finney is an evangelical. They knew what they were doing. I think they did it right. Some other people we remain nameless, think that basically God loves you and you're going to be wealthy or something like this. I mean, I, another matter. Yes, sir. Yes. Have a sense of humor. Uh -huh. 
I haven't, but I mean, I, I bet I should, huh? Uh, tell me about it. <laughs> there you go. If so it can be turned to his advantage is a good thing. Yeah. Well, thank you, Walter, for uh, joining the chorus of uh, of laughter this morning. Um, I have uh, one quick comment, yeah. and then I want to end with this question that I think would lead us well. The comment is, we've really enjoyed, um, as we've brought in different speakers, kind of hearing some recommendations of what you might recommend we start with uh, reading. If you have any recommendations for a bunch of lay people, what would be a good thing to read to kind of follow up to this conversation? That would be a good thing to read. Um, you know what I think would be a good thing to read? I mean, this is going to sound bad here, but you can get a hold of the Book of Common Worship, Presbyterian Church USA, and it'll have uh, the service for the Lord's Day in it, and it'll have the prayers and everything and the options in it. And I think the first thing to read is the first part of that service called the gathering and to look at the different prayers and stuff involved and then to be appreciate when you go into worship at a fine church like this, that you will have this same sequence gone through every time. It's trying to tell you something. Sometimes people in mainline churches feel like they never hear the gospel. I'm not sure quite what they mean by that. Uh, but I'm not going to worry about it. But if you go to a Presbyterian church, if you don't blot it out, and if they keep this part of the service together, see, it's got the whole gospel right there before you even then go to, uh, to, to reading Bible passage. So I would go there if you want to know the truth. And I'd talk over the service, and I'd ask some of the fine ministers here to tell you about what's going on in that service so that when you're in it, it doesn't just fly by but you'll see each one of these elements and how it works. And I think that'd be worth it, what I would do. That's a wonderful suggestion. And I do have a few copies of that from our elder training in my <laughs> office. Should anybody <laughs> like to borrow one? Um, it reminds me, I have two little girls who, they're twins that are two years old, and we start our day the same way every day. And they appreciate uh, routine, which I think many of us right. do. And I think sometimes uh, when we show up to worship every day, every week, we we've spent the whole week kind of forgetting that God is good. And so we need to show up right. and have that routine of remembering that God is good. Yeah. Um, and the good news about repetition is you repeat it and you know it. The bad news is sometimes you go on automatic pilot and you don't pay attention to it. It's like the Lord's prayer when you say it. But sometimes just sit down and read that, talk it over. How come it says your kingdom come rather than get me in a rocket ship and send me to the kingdom? Because it doesn't say get me in a rocket ship. It says your kingdom come. That's an interesting point. And there's a billion other ones in there too. That's, um, yeah. That's a wonderful point. Um, thank you, Dr. Otadi. I think we're kind of running out of time and I was not able to get to every question, but I feel confident that we can continue conversations in this space for a little bit of time. So I invite you to do so. I hope that you'll stick around sure. for a little Absolutely. bit. We've got coffee, we've Absolutely. got some bites. Um, and as we do, before we head into that time, I'd love to close us in a word of prayer. Um, so let's pray together. Gracious God, we give you thanks for this day. We give you thanks for the goodness of your creation and for the details of it that we see all around. We pray for the reminder to know that you are good and that it might shape our lives, who we are and how we behave in the world. Go with us into the week ahead. Guide us with your grace and your love. 
and help us to be transformed to love you and others even more. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Dr. Otak. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.